thank you for coming back from the coffee break. Uh, I know that this sort of mid-morning session, especially on the second day of such an action-packed conference, can be a little bit sort of hard to keep focused on. But we are very, very lucky to have someone who it will be easy to focus on, Sir Salman Rushdie, here with us. Uh, we heard Queen Rania of Jordan uh, tell us yesterday that her kids are very hard to impress, and the only way she's been able to impress them is by doing a video blog on YouTube. Uh, my kids, fortunately, are still very small, so they're easy to impress, but the reporters in my newsroom in New York are very, very hard to impress, and we interview CEOs all the time, so I can rarely impress them with what I'm going to do. But when I said I was going to have a chance to talk to Salman Rushdie, they were totally, totally impressed. And I'm going to ask him for a bunch of autographs well, at the end say, of this. I have to say, the only thing that impresses my children is that I'm talking to Google. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I do think that um, you know we are here with Google. We heard Sergey and Larry talk about their mission yesterday of organizing the world's information. But there actually has to be something to organize. There has to be content. So I think it is really important to talk to one of the premier creators of content of our time. And I discovered in reading Salman's new book that actually he started to write about Google and probably about Larry and Sergey. Oh, yeah. uh, when I read about a monarch so fabulously wealthy that he could allow a portion of his treasure to be poured into a giant hollow in the earth to dazzle and awe his guests. I think that's what Google has been doing for us over the past 24 hours. Um, that was exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> see? See, I, I, can, I can see into his mind. It, the first thing I wanted to ask you, Salman, though, was um, whether you think that the kind of work you do will still have an audience. 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we've been celebrating the information age and, and the great things that technology can do. Mm. But is it also shortening our attention spans? It might be, yeah. I mean, I, I, I hope not. Um, I don't know, I think, you know, the, 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 the death of the book has been forecast almost since the birth of the book. And it's an, it's an oddly resilient technology. You know, and it's, a, it's very interactive, you know, you can scribble all over it. You can drop it in the water, it still works. It doesn't lose any of its information. You can, you can, you can drop it in the sand, it, you know, it doesn't, there's all kinds of things you can do with it. Um, and it's, you know, you can set fire to it and that spoils it, but that would spoil a computer, that, that, I, which I have some experience of, but that, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but, you know, that would spoil a computer too. Um, no, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's pretty resilient, you know, and I think the desire of human beings to hear stories is an eternal desire, you know, and I don't think that's going to go away. I think there's certain kinds of book, I mean, non-fictional book, that may well actually be better served by being online, and, you know, encyclopedias, for example. And I think it's quite possible that encyclopedias will end up online rather than in book form because, for a start, they're easier to search. In, in that form. Do, do you, do you um, find the internet is useful for you in your research for your books? Well, increasingly, yeah. I mean, it, it, it didn't used to be, but the last two books I've written have been quite heavily researched. And um, I mean, Sha Shalimar the Clown has a lot of research to do with Islamic extremism and so on. And actually, truthfully, the internet wasn't that useful in that case. But in this case, and I'm talking about a, you know, events yeah. taking place 400 years ago um, in India and in Europe and everywhere in between, the Ottoman Empire and so on. It became essential almost, but, but the truth is that it wasn't the everyday web that was really helpful. Are, are you um, saying that Google wasn't good enough for you? I'm saying Google was only good enough up to a point. That's to say, you know, enormous breadth and not very much depth is the, is the general problem of the web, you know. But I think now that, because I have a kind of visiting professorship at the university in America, that gives me the password into the academic web, and, and the academic web actually solves that problem, because then you actually do have the depth. And, and what you do you mean by the academic web? What, 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 what well, is I mean, this Aladdin's sources. treasure? I mean scholarly sources. I mean, for example, I'm writing here in part about the reign of the great Emperor Akbar in the second half of the 16th century in India. The th there's three primary sources for the reign, which are three contemporary histories written you know, during his reign. 
very long, almost day by day accounts, written in Persian. And how's your Persian? My Persian is not good. Uh, my relationship with Persia also not good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you weren't uh, planning to do like a year abroad there to no, sort of no, bone no, up. No, I thought not. No, I have been actually to Iran, but it was in the the bad Free. old the bad old days before these bad old days. Um, I mean, when the Shah was still on the throne. Um, no, but you know what you can now do if you have the access to the scholarly material is that, that, that there are complete full texts in translation of all three of these books available online. So it means that I could have, you know, the Akbar Nama, the history of Akbar, in, in a good English translation, sitting side by side on my screen with the book I was trying to write. And I mean, that was just extraordinary. I mean, it saved me months and months of what would otherwise have been sitting in a library um, copying things out of books, you know, and in a way that would have been much harder to organize and use afterwards. So this time it was essential, but as I say, the key was having the password through, it, through a university library to get into the, the scholarly material. Was you know? it easy to find? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, JSTOR has a search engine too, you know, you, you, you go into these things and you type in, I mean, for instance, there's a moment in the book which takes place in the villa of the uh, 16th century condottiere of Genoa, um, Andrea Doria, better known as the name of a ship that sank, um, but actually once upon a time a great warlord in a way. And he built this very spectacular villa, still there. Um, you type in the words, I mean in the JSTOR search engine, you type in Andrea Doria villa, and what you get what I found were scholarly articles about the building of the villa, pictures of the villa, what art was in the villa, what the gardens looked like, floor plans of the villa. I mean, 10 times as much stuff as I would ever need to use, you know, but very comforting to find it, you know, because otherwise you make silly mistakes. You know, and, I mean, in a novel, you often do change things anyway, you know, because a novel is, uh, is not bound by the same rules as history quite, but you want to change them on purpose. You, know, you don't want to get it wrong on accident, by accident and have somebody afterwards tell you something you wish you'd known. You know? So it's been very useful, very useful, and I think will be increasingly useful. Um, although it, I must say, having written these two books that did, where I did all this research, my enormous desire right now is to write a book that doesn't need any research at all. <laughs> just to make stuff something up. Something that you can totally just, imagine? Just to make stuff up. That's why I got into this game. You know. And then uh, you discovered uh, you have to do all this research. Yeah, yeah, and it's fun. You know, I mean, I was a historian by training, I and mean, my subject was history, not, not literature. And, and so I've always been very interested in knowing really what did happen. You know? um, and then, as a, you know, in, in, in a novel, you do fool around with it a bit, but, but it's, it's, it's good to know it first, yeah. Well, since we're not allowed officially anyway to make things up at all no. as journalists, it's reassuring for me to know that even you have to do research. Yeah, I mean, that's and so, so remarkable that journalists never make things up. That's really <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite extraordinary. We, 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 we try to avoid it. Um, but do, do you worry that a darker side of the internet for you, for, yeah. for your profession, yeah. could be copyright. Is, is that something that you're concerned about? I think it is a problem. I mean, I think that, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why the academic web is password protected and all that, you know, is because this is work of immense scholarship that often takes years and years and years to produce. And if that was not protected, you know, if it was just freely available, there's work that wouldn't be done if there was no way for the, uh, for the scholars to benefit from it and, um, and to have it um, limited in access to people who seriously work with it. You know? So there's a, there is a problem about copyright and I mean, I, you know, I'm as interested in open availability of material as anyone, you know? but the problem when you work for a living is that you need to be paid for it. Um, and, and there is a difficulty, I mean, even though as I understand it, all the projects you know, understand that and talk about their, that finding a way to get the people compensated. You know, but there, there are serious problems. Here's one problem. Supposing, even supposing there was a completely acceptable deal made between the publishing industry and Google to put in copyright work online 
in a way that people could financially, the authors could financially benefit from people reading it. Supposing that happens, right? Wouldn't that be fantastic? You'd get more readers? Yes, it would be fantastic. But what it would do is d it just take English language, the English language. It would destroy global English language publishing. Why? It would mean that English, British publishers, Australian, South African, Indian publishers would essentially be driven out of business because of a deal done with an American publisher. It would turn the American Couldn't publisher... Couldn't they do their own deals? It wouldn't, wouldn't happen. If you've got the same text, you've got, it, it, would, it would turn the American publisher into the global publisher. And it would enormously damage publishing industries in other countries. The same would be true in the Spanish language, for example, or in any language which is international. Um, and it would, if you undermine the ability of local publishers in local countries to continue to work profitably, there are all kinds of books which simply would not exist because they're books that would be appropriate to an Australian readership, you know, that, could, that would be only published by an Australian publisher. And if that publisher is driven out of business because of the deals being done for online publishing with an American publisher, then there are books that won't be published. You know, so what's, what's do you happening think, Do you think that might be counterbalanced by the fact that people who might not have ever been published before who couldn't run yeah. that gamut yeah. of agent and publishing house yeah. are now able to get out there much more easily. Yeah, I think that's true. But I, what I'm saying is that there's certain kinds of really serious work that would become economically very hard to produce. And, and that's, uh, you know, the loss of the ability to work for 10 years on something, you know, um, and, um, and hope to be compensated for it. If you look at the nonfiction that's published now, leave aside fiction, you know, look at the non-fiction that's published now. Um, I just, there's a worry here about undermining the economic base and the international publishing industry, you know, and I think, I'm not saying it shouldn't happen, I'm saying people should be conscious of the problem, you know, and, and, and how we solve that problem will determine whether global publishing can continue to be viable, you know, and, and otherwise, what are you doing? You're killing the goose that lays the golden eggs, you know. I mean, an enormous amount of what's most interesting on the web now is still stuff which originates in book form um, or in print form, let's say. An enormous amount of the articles you find are, you know, are taken from something which was a print medium to begin with. Thank and, goodness. Well, I mean, I'm in favor of, as I say, this rather flexible, useful, highly contemporary technology um, called print. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I have any other newspaper colleagues here, but I will definitely let all print journalists know that you've said that. Yeah. Um, now, what Better about reviews, uh, what, <laughs> what about the uh, political implications of the internet? Well, I think there's you know again there's a lot to be said in, in uh, positively. I mean, I do think there is a very strong argument that when as is now the case, you, you, you essentially can't stop people anywhere in the world from getting some sense of what the rest of the world is like. You know, um, Even if you're a repressive dictatorship? Well, I mean, that's, you know, we should, yeah, there's that, let's come to that in a second. But I do think in general, the fact that people can have access to how the world is elsewhere is a very powerful factor to in, in the changing of the world. That's to say, if you show people a better life that's available somewhere else, they actually want it. You know, and it makes them want it more strongly when they can see it and read about it and experience it. And that's why I do think there, I mean, I suppose we have to talk about China because it, it's, that's where a lot of the issue is right now. And um, I mean, with my American pen writer's hat on, you know, we've been working very hard to try and put pressure on the Chinese government why? Uh, what, this, what, what, is, what, is your, what is your particular engagement here? Well, but, you know, in this run-up to the Olympics, one of the agreements that the Chinese made, as a result of which they were given the Olympics, was that they would improve their human rights record um, and that they would provide free access to the Internet. I mean, those were, that's actually in their proposal on the basis from which the, the Olympics were given to them. They've made no steps towards doing this. In fact, they've done the opposite. They've actually arrested more writers and journalists rather than letting any of them go. Are I they mean, being um, charged with things, no, these I arrested mean, at the writers? Moment, Penn, we've, we've identified 39 prominent writers and journalists who, who have just been swept up by the Chinese in recent months and are in jail and not charged with anything. I mean, they are simply 
they've been locked up. As a sort of precautionary as measure? As a precautionary measure. And, and um, these, these writers and journalists could be released today. I mean, it's not like they're waiting any kind of due process. You know, they're just, they're just being held at the government's pleasure. You know? So, um, and this, it seems to me, is directly counter to what the Chinese said they do um, in, uh, in the, in the run-up to the Olympics. And then there's, you know, I guess the other, the, the internet service provider related issue, which is... Which is? Which is that Google and Yahoo and others agreed with the Chinese censorship regulations. And do you, you think know? that's and wrong? That's a, well, of course it's wrong. You know, um, I mean, it's, it seems to well, me... Well, wait a minute. There is a counter-argument, yeah. which is that by having internet sources in mm. China, yeah. you contribute in a slower way to democratization and that it is better to be there, albeit with restrictions, where's than the to not where's be the there evidence, at all. Where's the evidence of the democratization? What has happened in China that has democratized it? This is a an authoritarian, repressive dictatorship that happens to be rather rich and that we all want to deal with. And so people are giving China, for some reason, a free pass. And I don't see why it gets it. You know, And it seems to me that the, the enormous influence and power of, of Google and of Yahoo and the other major internet service providers could actually be used in a beneficial way here. And it's, it's, uh, it's worrying to see how easily those those limitations had been accepted. And again, like I say, this was a part of the Chinese uh, proposal on the, base, on the basis of which they were given the Olympics, that they would provide free access to the internet. They have not done so. You know? um, and we've still got whatever it is, you know, 90 days or something. You know, it, it can still be achieved, but it needs to be achieved with the help of Google um, and the others. Okay, well, I see Nikesh nodding and taking notes, so we'll expect a radical shift yeah. in Google policy over the next uh, couple of days. Um, you've had your own uh, very difficult encounters uh, with another part of the world and its struggle with modernity, mm. Islam. Um, tell us a little bit about that and about how you see the Islamic world dealing with modernity now. Well, you know, I mean, the thing the thing we were saying before, which I think is worth repeating, is that the, the, the very curious thing about the way in which the Khomeini fatwa was was applied was that you had essentially this is the fatwa against you against against the satanic verses, not just me, but against publishers and translators um, as well. Um, is that here you had essentially a a medievalist worldview? which was being propagated by the use of absolute cutting-edge information technology. I mean, Internet-enabled fatwa? Yeah, yes. I mean, if you look at uh, the way in which the attack on the book was orchestrated, you know, it was orchestrated with very high efficiency using all the tools of the Internet, you know, so that you would find from all across the world people singing, literally singing from the same song sheet, you know, the same bullet points, the same, exactly the same quotes, etc., were being disseminated at very high speed um, through the internet. And so here, I think it's really the first example where, in which the internet was used as a tool of attack. You know, um, uh, it, was, it was used as a way of orchestrating an attack, in this case, on one book um, and its authors and publishers. And it's the curious, the curious contradiction that you had here a technology arising out of modernity being used in the service of an ideology which rejected modernity. You know, I mean, Khomeini described his revolution as a revolt against history. That's what he called it. You know, that history itself, you know, progress, forward movement, that was the problem, you know. Um, and yet, what the tools they were using were absolutely, and continue to be, um, does, cutting does, edge tools. Does this same paradox apply to Al-Qaeda? Is Al-Qaeda you know, an internet-powered I mean, phenomenon? Well, we know that it is. We know that they use internet cafes all the time, and that they're, they're constantly, I mean, if they were not internet cafes, their communications would be much more difficult. Um, so, so here again, you have you know, an extremely, uh, I mean, not just medieval, but actually, if it wasn't so violent, it would also be banal. You know, I mean, that's to say there's a kind of stupidity here. Um, it's just violent stupidity, so we have to take it seriously. Um, but this is being, th this form of stupidity is being propagated thanks to the enormous intelligence of the many brilliant people who've created this, uh, this, this tool. You know? So 
it just shows that although I do believe that it is primarily and largely a tool for good, that people benefit from it much more than they are damaged by it, there is this way in which it, it can be used, just as you know, any tool. You can, you can stab somebody with a pen you know, um, if you want to. Um, a tool is just a tool. I'm going to throw things open to questions in a few minutes, so please prepare your questions. Uh, start uh, coming to the mics. And I'll ask a couple more questions of Salman so you can sort of brace yourselves. Um, I wonder, because of the fatwa, you really were thrust into an overtly political conflict. Yeah. But aside from that, what do you think the role of writers is today in society? How, how, how do you see your role? Is it just, is it mostly about writing your books? Is it also about taking a stand? You know, I, I, I've always thought it was a little bit both. Um, and the first great writer I ever knew was the, was the Urdu poet Fez Ahmed Fez, who was a, a close friend of my family's. And so I kind of literally, he was like an extra uncle for me. And he, he was certain things I'm not. I mean, he was always, he was a card carrying communist and, and uh, winner of the Lenin Prize and so on. And, He's um, worked, this was a different time, though, Different wasn't time, it? yeah. Um, in those days, uh, well, I don't know. It, it was a different time. Um, but the thing about Fez, which is very interesting, is that on the one hand, he was a great love poet. He was a genuinely great lyric poet. Uh, many of his poems were actually set to music and became kind of hit songs and so on. So, so he was a great romantic poet, but he was also a public poet. I suppose the closest Western comparison would be somebody like Pablo Neruda. Um, who was able to both deal with the private and the public. And, and, um, and is that your goal, to and, do uh, Well, that? I, I guess, you know, I grew up, as it were, looking at this as the, my first model of a writer, you know. And, and I just grew up thinking, well, that's the job. You know, that, that, yeah, you do sit there and talk about the extremely important private material of the heart and, and, and how human beings are with each other and so on. But, but there's also this other side. That, and I also think it's because the world has changed now. Uh, we no longer lead entirely private lives. You know, the, 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 the public arena affects our private lives in a way that a couple of hundred years ago it really didn't. You know, I mean, Jane Austen could write, I mean, Jane Austen's career is exactly contemporary with the Napoleonic Wars. You know, Pride and Prejudice is written <coughs> like the year before the Battle of Waterloo. You know, um, and yet, in her novels, that almost never enters. You know, this extraordinary apart event. Apart from the, dashing apart officers. From, yes, apart from soldiers looking cute at parties. That's the, the function of the British Army in the novels of Jane Austen is to look cute at parties, you know, which is kind of important, one agrees. But you know, defeating Napoleon Bonaparte appears not so much. You know, so, uh, but it's because if you look at the world of her characters, it is so separated from the public world, that she can actually describe their lives and explain their lives completely without having to bring in the Napoleonic Wars. Now, you know, we live smashed up against history, you know, much more than we ever used to, and those public events affect our private lives you know, quite directly. You know? and, and so to try and explain the lives of your characters, you know, it, it now seems that a part of that explanation involves the public arena. You know, and I think that's, that's what I try to do. And in terms of direct political action, I have to say I used to be more interested in that than I am. I mean, I started out as quite a... Have you become disillusioned? Surely no, not. I just, no, I just think, you know, I was always a writer who was interested in politics and taking up positions and writing, you know, polemical pieces and so on and so on. And then, you know, it's like, be careful what you wish for, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I got a serious overdose of politics. And, and now, you know, frankly, I'm not that interested. I'm not as interested as I used to be. That's we just, will tell Gordon Brown. You know, he's probably got my vote, but, you know, God knows why. Um, <laughs> um, um, only because the alternative is David Cameron, I suppose. You know, but that's... A, um, that's always been the good luck of Labour parties in recent years is who they're up against. Um, okay, on that note, I'm going to see if there are any questions from the audience. Hi. Um, 
I'm a little confused and this offended. This is a, a ninja question? No, no, this is just a, 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 from one author to another question. Yeah. Um, I'm a little uh, um, offended by the notion that um, good work needs to be password protected, like on the academic web, that, that somehow you and the ivory tower are able to access uh, much better works of literature as opposed to uh, the hoi polloi that, that, are, that are out there on the, just the general web. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know, like, I, I just think that the, the, those 10 year labors of love that you were talking about, th those, are, those are usually niche, uh, small works, labors of love that if they get $10,000 in advance or even $130,000 in advance or whatever, like uh, amortized out over 10 years, that's still not a living wage. Love. So, uh, I mean, don't, don't you think that if you let those things free, like Cory Doctorow and Boing Boing uh, um, advocates, like those works of art will flourish and be actually even more sustainable in a published form? Well, I understand that that's the argument. I mean, I understand that that's the argument. I'm saying that intellectual property is a, is a form of property like anything else. You know, I mean, uh, it, it belongs to the creator of the property in the same way as his briefcase or his house. You know, it's a, it's a possession. And I think there's a problem when you try and suggest that the possession should be generally available without compensating the person properly for it. You know, and, uh, universities, which is where the academic web is, what I was talking about, clearly universities' main property is intellectual property. That's what they actually own. They may have buildings and so on, you know. But the, right, right. But, but did the, like did the translators that of the works that you read did they get a nickel every time you read it? Like they, they didn't make any money off of that. It was the it was the large, uh, you know, clearing houses of information that were making any money, if at all, from from no. from your research. No, well, I mean, it's not. There's no there's no um, there was no charge for this. I mean, let's say if you if you if you have an academic accreditation, you simply have access to. It's like you know, if you belong to a university, you have a card which lets you use the library. You know, if you don't have a university membership card, you don't use the university library. It's the same principle, you know. Um, you, the general public doesn't go and borrow books from a university library because it's there for the use of the scholars. Now, why is that not a principle that one can maintain? Because there's a reason for it. What's uh, the reason for it? The reason for it is that scholarship is serious business, you know, and that and you have to create an environment in which it can take place. In the ivory um, tower of like just no, it's not sterilized. an ivory tower. I don't know what I mean. I don't believe in ivory towers. Well, you but, believe in locking away information against people. No, that, I that believe might not interpreted no, in the no, no, incorrect no. way. No, what I'm saying is that, that information belongs to the people who create it, and you'd better understand that. You'd better understand that. You can't say that you have to just have it because you want it. You know, it belongs to someone. You can't steal someone's car, nor can you steal their ideas. Okay, I wanted an uh, active dialogue, oh, no. and I got it. Oh, no. Please. Um, when Doris Lessing picked up her Nobel Prize, she said, uh, I think the exact quote, the internet has seduced a whole generation with its inanities. I wonder if what you thought of that opinion and whether it was typical of the way many authors think. I, no, I, don't, I, mean, I, I didn't hear it, actually, but um, if that's what she said... It was I'm part not sure. of a much longer tirade, but that was, was, it? That was the, yeah. sort of, that was the headline. Well, Doris has had a, a, a magnificently grumpy reaction to the Nobel Prize, um, <laughs> which is kind of, I think, unique in my experience. Nobody's ever been so bad-tempered about winning the Nobel Prize. Um, um, no, I don't think it's very general. I mean, I think most of us use the Internet every day in a way that recognizes its enormous value. You know, I mean, I think I... There isn't a day when I don't use the Google search engine dozens of times. You know? so, and I don't think that's uh, at all exceptional. Uh, I do think that a lot of what is out there on the web is pretty dumb. You know? um, and I suppose if you want to sink in that sea, you can. You know? um, but you don't have to. You know? and it's, I do worry about this kind of blurt culture, you know, where, where people just put out their, their whole private lives and there it is, you know, and it's a... Um, What's, wh why do you worry? What's well, wrong because, because if you're in... I mean, I'm interested in having generations grow up which retain the ability to think rigorously, 
you know, and to, and to be careful about utterance. You know, to, that, that's to say, that, that to, not to write carelessly, but carefully. You know, not to think carelessly, but carefully. And, and, and the problem of this, uh, this endless confession that is now taking place, you know, millions and millions and millions of people simply saying everything about their lives every day, um, just, out, just putting it out there, is that it can't be careful. By definition, something happening at that speed, at that quantity, in that quantity, cannot be done. It's not, nobody cares whether it's, they, you know, it's not supposed to be careful. It's just stuff. And, and it does worry me that it may produce a generation that is less capable of careful thought. You know, um, and if there's one thing we need, it's that. You know, we, we need rigor and discipline in thinking. Um, that's the same rigor and discipline that created the internet. You know, I mean, that's to say you couldn't have created the technology carelessly, you know, and yet somehow it encourages carelessness. Um, and that's one of the paradoxes of it. But I don't think that's the whole story of the internet, you know. I mean, uh, you know, 99 out of 100 videos on YouTube are nonsense, and the hundredth one is extremely funny or very interesting. You know, so I mean, you go into Someone a bookshop. Someone is a fan of the Condi Rap. Yeah, the Condi Rap. There's discovered. lots of things I'm a fan of. You know, you go into a bookshop. Most books in the bookshop are bad books. You know, um, go to the movie theater. Most movies are bad movies. You know, um, so it's not unique to the internet that most utterances in that form are not of high quality, you know, but in just in the same way as we don't judge literature, you know, by the works of Dan Brown, um, you know. <laughs> um, well, some of us do, I guess. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. You can either judge something by its worst case or by its best case. It seems to me that at, that at the best case of the internet, it's astonishingly valuable. You know? uh, Please. Um, Florian Langenscheid, even though we publish rather encyclopedia and dictionaries and not fiction, I've been following your work uh, for many, many years with a lot of admiration. And my rather personal question is, what is the source of your pretty unique and amazing um, amount of optimism, faith, and particular civil courage? Where do you have it from? Well, gosh, that's a, well, I mean, it's a nice question. I mean, you just leave it as a question. <laughs> 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 just, um, uh, but but I, mean, I do think that I've always thought that, that, the kind of, that optimism is kind of the fuel required to, to make a creative act, you know, that's what, whatever it may be. You know. uh, that writing a book is an unusually optimistic creative act because it takes quite a long time. It's done in private, um, and then you offer it up and hope that people like it. You know, and, and um, you couldn't do that really unless you were some kind of optimist. Um, and I think that's that's to an extent true of all creative action. You know, it's it's an optimistic act. It's an act of making something and offering it. You know, and in the belief that that's a valuable thing to do, and and in the and in the hope that it will be seen to be valuable. You know, and. And essentially, if people don't like what you write, it's your fault, you know, and you can't blame other people. And if, if they do like what you write, nobody else can take the credit, uh, which is one of the reasons why I like books. In movies, of course, they say that if movies are successful, everybody takes the credit, and if they're unsuccessful, it's the writer's fault. <laughs> um, so it's one of the reasons why I think, although I love cinema and I love theater and there was a point in my life where I wanted to be an actor and there was a point in my life in which I wanted to make movies. I think the reason I do this is because I actually like the solitariness of it. I actually, I actually like the fact that I make this by myself you know, um, and that it is essentially the utterance of one mind, you know, one vision of the world. You know, and, then, and then you offer it to people and hope they find it interesting. But I do think what I'm saying is whatever the form, whether it's whether it's new technology or old, whether it's new forms of art or old ones, I think there is an inbuilt optimism in the desire to do something like that. You know, uh, I mean, I've been a lucky writer, you know, in the sense that from my quite young days, I mean, from my second novel, um, I acquired quite substantial international readership. And, and, you know, it's fortunate that it's kind of stuck around mostly, you know. Most writers are not that lucky. You know? I mean, most writers have a much harder time of it. 
um, and yet the books get written. And, and uh, you know, a bookshop is a place of re reflecting that optimism. You know? And I mean, I'm very, I don't know quite what the literary implications of, of the internet will be. I mean, I'd say it's clear that this is in a very incipient form, a kind of literary or artistic response to the internet. You know? I mean, also in visual arts, I think we don't quite know yet what, the, what visual arts might eventually come out of this, this new form. But there's certain things which I think are quite interesting about what the internet makes possible. I mean, for instance, there's a great story of Borges called The Garden of Forking Paths, um, in which eventually it turns out that The Garden of Forking Paths is a book. Um, it's a book in which the author tries to write about every possible variation of every possible action. You know, so two people meet, they fall in love, they don't fall in love. Story one, story two. You know? And so, of course, what the book is a form of insanity because immediately, like nuclear fission, the possibilities explode. You know? and, and the book becomes impossible to finish and it drives the author mad and so on. Now, it seems to me that what Borges rather brilliantly intuited was the hyperlink. You know? Because what the hyperlink does is to allow you to tell a story sideways. You know, instead of telling a story from beginning to end, you can tell it sideways, you can tell it in all kinds of variant forms. Um, you can use the link to fill in backstory or to prefigure things in the future. You know, in other words, it gives you a completely different narrative structure you know, um, from the structure you're obliged to have in a book where you physically must turn the pages in order to get through the story. So are you going to write a hyperlinked book? Will I mean, that I'm, be you know, your next I don't know. project? No, it's not. No, it may just be not, it may be a project for somebody half my age. You know, it, uh, it may be the next generation's project. I mean, you know, there have been attempts in literature to do something like this. There's Cortázar's famous novel, Hopscotch, you know, Rayuela, um, in which you can read either from beginning to end, or you can play Hopscotch, where he, where he t gives you a list of, you know, where you can read the chapters out of sequence. And, and you, can, you can arrive actually at a different story by reading, the by reading the chapters out of sequence. So there have been people who've tried to play with the structure of the book so that the book is not read start to finish. You know? uh, but, but the internet gives you a possibility there just so easily, you know, much more straightforwardly than it's ever existed before. I also think that something to do with the confessional nature of the, of, of the web, you know, something to do with the way in which people put everything out there and yet are often cloaked in anonymity. There's something very interesting there. You know, some curious paradox between revelation and concealment, you know, um, that, I mean, in theory, on, you, could, you could confess to anything on the internet. You, know, you could confess to a murder, and nobody would take you seriously. You could have a blog about how you're a serial killer, and you might be a serial killer, but people would just think you were some jerk writing a blog. You know, so there's, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that I think we're only just beginning to see what kinds of stories could be told using this. You know, um, That's and such an optimistic thought. Yeah. Well, as I say, go. writing goes on. You know, and, and the next generation will come up with things to write which we can't think of, and they will use the tool better than I can, unquestionably. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, Nikesh yesterday mentioned that um, the two of the three most popular searches that day in the UK were Amy Winehouse and Britney Spears. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're, you know. Yes, I'm familiar well, with them. Well, <laughs> that, that underscores my point. So it mm. seems that on the internet, uh, the cult of, of the celebrity um, has just taken off mm. immensely. So Time Warner, when they talk about all their properties, and they have some pretty amazing cultural properties, yeah. assets, creators that they've had in their, in their portfolio, the thing that they're most proud of is TMZ, 10 Mile Zone, which is a celebrity site that, mm -hmm. you know, paparazzi follow all these stars, and now they've made it into a TV show because it's been so popular online. Yes. And you have these celebrities that have become global uh, points of interest, yeah. where Perez, pa Paris Hilton, when she exits jail, is a big thing in China. And it seems to me that that is a new phenomenon, yes, at yes. least to that scale. And I was just curious to hear why you think that is, and, and can you be optimistic about that too? No, I can't. No. <laughs> no. No, I think it's the curse of our time. You know? and, and I think this is, I mean, the, the, the role of the internet in magnifying phenomena is, is, is very well demonstrated by this. That, you, know, you can put 
almost anything out there and it becomes a million times the size, you know, or, or, at, at once. And that can be good or it can be bad. I mean, what, you know, what you're saying is clearly an example of the less valuable uses of, of this thing. And I, but I think, you know, celebrity culture is not the creation of the web. You know, I mean, it's, it's a thing which exists everywhere anyway. And, and, and what the internet is doing is, 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 is making it bigger. And, and uh, in theory, creating, I mean, creating the possibility of financial exploitation because these non-entities who become global brands overnight suddenly become multimillionaires the day after that. You know? so, um, so there's a kind of capitalist, if you like, exploitation of the phenomenon of celebrity. I just think it's a very empty thing. I mean, people are becoming, you know, like, at least Amy Winehouse can sing. You know, I mean, she actually is talented. Um, but in every other sense of the world, word, she's a catastrophe. You know, and, and Britney Spears can't even sing so well, but she's <laughs> certainly a catastrophe. You know, and I also think there's a problem here for news coverage. The way in which celebrity is 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 invading news coverage. You know, and I've just arrived from the United States. If you watch the news in America. A very substantial portion of it is devoted to what happened to Paris today and what happened to Brittany today, you know, and and you know Afghanistan not so interesting, you know, and and I think it's in a way creates it makes me think about about how books are no longer supposed to be the thing that brings the news, you know, because now we have all this stuff, this amazing, you know, I mean, actually I have Google News as my homepage because I find it a very useful way of getting the news without bias, if you like, you know, just getting the world's news. Um, so, but an enormous amount of Google News is drawn from print media. You know, um, I worry that the broadcast media and even the internet, you know, is really providing a very skewed version of the news based on what you say, based on the enormous growth of celebrity culture. Um, and that it still may be, may be therefore the function of book writers to do the kind of serious work of doing, of coming up with the stuff that actually is the news. You know? And that's why I think that this is still a more print-led culture than one might like to think. You know? it's a, a lot of the new ideas and the discoveries and the innovations and the analyses and the opinions which then get multiplied by the internet are still beginning in print form. Now, this may not always be true, but I think it's true now. Uh, but I, do, I, I think you know, celebrity culture is, it is the great curse of our time. It's like the computer virus in the society. <laughs> Can celebrity culture also be helpful to people creating this more serious, more valuable content? Can, can I mean, you be part of celebrity culture? I don't know. I mean, it has does that help you sell books? No. No, it doesn't. It just helps you be famous. Um, I mean, I write the wrong kinds of books. You know, if I was writing about what I did with my breast implants, you know, those would be bestsellers. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean the best-selling writer in England today is Jordan. You know, I mean, that's how, that's the, the, the sign of how bad things have got. Um, you know, it, I mean, I guess it's because J.K. Rowling's not publishing books this year, but, 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 but given that, you know, the fact that this woman who is essentially famous for breast implants is now the best-selling writer in this country is terrifying. Terrifying, if, if you're me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and I fear that on that terrifying note, oh, yeah. we have to conclude. All right. um, I think we should all do our part to fight celebrity culture by reading this really fabulous book. <laughs> um, it's great, and um, I do think that there are some coded Google references. Oh, yeah, all over it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Spot the coded Google reference. Um, <laughs> so. It's been a, a real pleasure for Thank me you. to uh, hear your thoughts about the world and about the role of thinkers and the need to fight repression in China. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you very much. much. Thank you.